Welcome to the Tefl Commute. This is Season 2, Episode 3, Life Sentence, in which Lindsay and I are joined by Scott Thornbury to discuss model sentences that appear in course books. We'll also see a return of the game timeline, and an episode wouldn't be complete without some more Facebook philosophy. Cue the intro music and let's go. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the TEFL Commute. My name is Lindsay Clanfield. And I'm Sean Wilder, and welcome back, everyone. Yes, and this is a podcast for language teachers that's not about language teaching, but the subject will surely come up. And I think it's surely going to come up in this episode, Lindsay. I, Don't I think avoid it's it. a language teaching episode, because this episode is going to be all about sentences. Um... And we're going to start with, actually, a test for the listeners, okay? So if you're listening to this on your commute to work, here's a little test for you. I'm going to name four structures, four grammatical structures. Uh, I'm going to pause for a couple of seconds each time, and I want you to think of a sentence that would illustrate this structure, okay? So get ready, listeners. Here, you go. Here it comes. Structure one, second conditional. Structure two, Past continuous and past simple. Structure three, going to for future predictions with present evidence. Okay, that's going to for future predictions with present evidence. And structure four is present perfect for experiences. So I'll go through them again. I want you to think of a sentence that would illustrate each of these. The first one was the second conditional. The second was the past continuous and past simple. The third was going to for future predictions with present evidence. And the fourth was present perfect for experiences. Now, I made you do this quickly because I wanted the first thing that came into your mind. And I want you to compare with what Sean and I came up with as our sentences and how many of them were the same. So for the second conditional, we had, Sean, what did we have? If you had a million dollars. Uh-huh. What would you spend it on? Something to do with us. So if you had anything like that, dollars, pounds, yen, euros, a uh, lottery. Past continuous and past simple, Sean? Oh, that's got to be having a bath when the uh, phone rang. So she was having yep. a bath when the phone rang. And going to for future predictions of present evidence? Look, Sean? black clouds. It's going to rain. Okay. And present perfect for experiences? Well, that will be, have you ever eaten in some kind of restaurant? Probably Chinese. Yes. <laughs> have you ever, ever eaten food. Chinese food? Yes. That's a, or another exotic food. As Chinese started becoming more and more common, I think, started moving to other exotic foods. So, there you have it. See if you tied in with us. And we're going to um, actually now bring someone else into our conversation. Uh, can everyone... Uh, well, welcome to Scott Thornbury. Scott, Hi. Hi. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, Sean. Hi. I started imagining I had like a live audience there that was going to clap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, Scott, thanks very much for joining us. Scott Pleasure. is a teacher, trainer, and writer of several books um, for teachers, methodology books, including several on grammar. Actually, can you give us a quick rundown of some of the grammar books uh, you've written just for our in case they don't know? It's only know? a 20-minute podcast, uh, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's, I've written five books with the word grammar in the title. I'm sort of slightly ashamed to say, including how to teach grammar about language, which is grammar tasks, uh, which I'm doing a second edition of, uh, and one called Natural Grammar, and a couple of others in there. One just called Grammar. <laughs> Right. So you're the perfect person to have on this podcast where we're going to be talking about grammar and sentences. That the little thing that I did with the learners there, uh, with the learners, with the listeners, um, do you have any others? I mean, would you consider those also the prototypical ones, Scott? Or can you suggest other ones like for present continuous or anything else? Well, I mean, the present continuous is an interesting example because I remember the days when I first started teaching, it was very difficult to think of a, 
of an example that was plausible of the present continuous when you're talking about something happening at the moment of speaking. Uh, so you were kind of reduced to situations like, you know, uh, commenting or commentating on uh, news. So, for example, the queen is just stepping out of her car now, that kind of thing. Right, but, okay. of course, now with mobile phones, I mean, it's changed completely. I mean, people are constantly giving running commentary on what they're doing. I'm just popping into Tesco's. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I mean that's kind of solved that problem in a sense because I think one of the one of the problems about these sentences is whether they are uh, you know as I say plausible or credible would anybody uh, actually ever say them it's interesting the one that the second conditional if you oh no the the past continuous one about the shower yeah um, she was having a or a bath when the phone rang I just did a quick uh, search on a two billion word corpus to see whether uh, when the phone rang ever co uh, collocates with Bath. Uh, it never <laughs> does. It's not a sing single thing. Has it, it never happened? It's never happened, obviously, in the whole <laughs> history of humanity. But it does happen with a shower three times. But it's, it's interesting, it's not the past continuous. It's he had been in the shower when the phone rang. He was, was in the shower when the phone rang. Or Sarah had just gotten out of the shower when the phone rang. But it's interesting that these kind of what we think of as being very representative examples are not, are not that representative when it comes to actual raw data. That particular huh. example, though, is is probably one of the most famous sentences in course books, isn't it? I mean, any teacher will come forward with that example. Uh, Absolutely. But, I mean, there's a good reason for this, I think. I mean, I mean, it's, it's easy to laugh at them, but they are... Uh, it, you know, anybody who has written uh, grammar books or written uh, or designed lessons teaching specific items of grammar knows that you need models which are uh, representative in the sense that they're kind of prototypical and situations which everybody in the class can identify with and that they're intelligible, that they have language in them, that there's no vocabulary in them that's beyond the, the, <clears throat> the student's present level. So that's why I think you know, look at black clouds, it's going to rain, is a good example. It's prototypical and it's intelligible. Right, so a little bit like you take the prototypical meaning of something, even though maybe other meanings or other instances would be more common. I, I think great. I heard about this, like like for words, you could do it as well. So if hand, uh, you know, we think of the, the thing at the end of your arm with five fingers on it, but actually there would maybe be more common things of like, give me a hand, do you need a hand, exactly. and things like that, but we would teach first Exactly. That's and I think this is where dictionaries have to make these kind of same decisions too. What examples that they do they choose the most frequent or do they choose the most prototypical as their first example? Um, and it's the same for grammar examples, I think. Mm. Here, here's, a qu here's a question that I had thinking when I was thinking of these, these sentences, and I've done this with several teachers, uh, I'd be interested uh, from our listeners if they leave a comment on Facebook or on the blog if they chose the exact or close to same sentences as, as we did at the top of the episode. But it makes me wonder is there like a universal box, like Chomsky's black box, but a universal grammar box of sentences that is in everyone's brain, um, or uh, in English speakers, or in sort of generally like humans, or yeah, I, I mean, I think the material, the same material too, too often. Well, I think this comes back to the thing of prototypes. Henry Widdison's argued this, uh, the, the argument between what's sort of genuine and what's authentic. Uh, an authentic sentence for most speakers of English if you said, give me an authentic, it would be something like, John kissed Mary. In other words, subject, verb, object. Right. Uh, not Mary was kissed by John, for example. So, uh, and he would argue, what is now, this is the prototype, and you can't get away from that, even though that's maybe not most, the most common, or even a very um, politically, <laughs> politically correct okay. uh, example. But this, uh, this is where we're at, I think. We're ha this is the tension between authenticity on the one hand and prototypicality. So when you talk about a universal box of sentences, I say, yes, in our heads we carry around, in a sense, a universal box of prototypical sentences. Hmm. Right. Sean, sure. so you know, we need to get I, I, away from I, I was thinking of what my, pro if I had prototypical sentences in my head, I was thinking about a different language that I speak to, to wonder... If if they're in there, it's, it's, it's interesting, but it, it, this balance of I mean, we we do drive for authenticity in other areas. Yet we we have the most inauthentic sentences when we start. It's quite a a mismatch, really, isn't it? 
Yeah, I think what's interesting is that uh, yeah, when you talk about other languages, I mean, of course, the one that comes to my mind in French is la plume de maton et sous la table. And there are these kind of historically famous sentences. Like you ask any Spanish learner what the prototypical uh, English sentence is, and would be my tailor is rich. Although it's been about fifty years since that appeared in a course book. <laughs> Uh, okay. now, I don't know where these things came from, but if you go even further back, of course, you back into the classics, into Latin and Greek textbooks, uh, you find uh, the most bizarre sentences. There's no sense that authenticity even mattered, because after all, you're dealing with a dead language, so to hell with it. So you get, you know, that much cited uh, sentence from a Latin grammar. Henry Sweet cited this years ago. The philosopher pulled the lower jaw of the hen. And what, what, what does that mean? I mean, was that <laughs> was he doing it on purpose, or, or was this a thing? Well, I mean, I think this is slightly apocryphal. I, I'm not even sure that this sentence exists. Henry Sweet wanted to make the point that we need to be more authentic, and this is way back in the turn of the previous last century. Oh, okay. uh, but I mean, as Guy Cook pointed out in a, in the paper when he looked at some of these sentences, he said the ironical thing is although. Henry Sweet mocked that sentence merciless, mercilessly. Everybody now knows it and can remember it. I mean, and it's 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 very bizarreness that makes it me makes it memorable. So maybe this is one of the problems with she was having a bath when the phone rang is that it's kind of representative, but it's not going to stick in the student. It's not going to sort of stand out or be memorable. Uh, and so again, this is another tension in terms of memorability. I mean, I've tried to get around this in various ways. One is to use song titles, for example. Um, so, you know, she's leaving home. Uh, yes. It's a good representative uh, uh, sentence for the present continuous. And in fact, I wrote, I used a number of these Beatles titles in a book that I um, wrote a few years back. And the publishers just at the last <laughs> jump suddenly got got um, cold feet and thought, oh my god, we better check who owns these song titles of the Beatles. And of course, it was Michael oh, Jackson. Or something like that. Or <laughs> Michael Jackson, that's right. <laughs> and they said, there's no way we can use them. So they had to go in the bin and I had to come up with, but I mean, I do nevertheless still have, it's great now because of Google and everything and you can, or iTunes, you just go into there and look for song titles. I have lists and lists and lists of song titles, which for example, I've got, here's a few which are all questions. Are you lonesome tonight? Uh -huh. Why does my heart feel so bad? What happened to you? Here's one for you, Lindsay. When will I be famous? Why did we do it? <laughs> <laughs> but these are fantastic. So I use these on training courses and that where I'm out of the, you know, out, uh, my below the parapet, as it were, so I can't get hit for permissions. But, um, but because people know the songs, they kind of remember, and, and this is goes to, you know, learners know a lot of these songs too, they've heard them. Uh, and so these are great sources for example sentences. I'd imagine then perhaps uh, you could also imagine that like cat catchphrases uh, from films, uh, exactly. maybe not film titles so much, but certainly cat like I'll Be Back, I'm sure would make uh, a good... Make my day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> make my day. Um, <laughs> no, I'll Be good. Back, I'm sure there are other ones. And I, I wonder if you're not also, I mean, I'm hearing my son using uh, kind of prototypical sentences coming from memes. So, um, you know, uh, but, but they kind of play around with the grammar a bit, but there's certain, like, there's one going around right now. Have you heard, have either of you heard this one? Uh, what do you mean? Have you heard that one? Is that, no, there's a song or memes. there's a kind of, there's a youtube -y kind of thing. That's because you don't have, like, uh, 11 to 14 year olds <laughs> constantly on the computer watching millions of YouTube videos. But what exactly. do you mean? They're all saying it, and his friends are saying it at school. And this is something kind of like going around. Exactly. There's a great one going around Facebook at the moment. It's a picture of of <laughs> Tom Waits and Jeremy Irons. Have you seen oh, that? Yes. Tom Waits <laughs> while Jeremy Irons. And the, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> present, present simple third person is. You'll never forget that. That's no, no. Tom Waits while Jeremy Irons. I'm sure that also sounds like a kind of thing that would have appeared in a 1970s course book, but with invented names before they were even famous. Oh, that's a fantastic one. It looks like the choir is ready. So here's some Facebook philosophy.
Teachers who inspire know that teaching is like cultivating a garden. Those who would have nothing to do with thorns must never attempt to gather flowers. Author unknown. Uh, so we, uh, so we're we going to get away from from these sort of prototypical sentences then, because if you've got like this um, online corpus of I, of iTunes of of memes on 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 Facebook and even using Google Search, does, is that going to kind of change the sentences that we use, or are we well, always going to default back? Change them, in, yeah. It's changed them in dictionaries now. Dictionaries, most learners' dictionaries use uh, authentic corpus based uh, citations, but you do have to. I mean, I'm working on the second edition, as I said, of about language now, and I'm replacing a lot of the. Uh, examples with stuff I've got access to a corpus and it's it's a hard work because again you've got to find something which is short not too f- broken up and it's uh, intelligible doesn't have vocabulary in it but at the same time you do find some wonderful things and I think because you never know quite what the context context is. this is one I found this morning am I my dad's son still or am I his daughter am I her wife am I her husband is this is this from a modern thing or how old is this? Yeah, this is super modern. Uh, but I mean, you'd have to kind of bury in to find out what the big, the full context is. But I mean, you know, it's very simple language. Uh, anything that a student could understand, but it's completely bizarre. I think uh, I remember a conversation like this with Ken Wilson, who said he had a, he came across a dialogue of these wonderful sentences, where again you'd have to dig into the context. But they were things like, "Is this a leg? I think I I think I've got a hand." Um, is that is that an arm? And it, it, the context turned out to be two people doing a jigsaw puzzle. Uh-huh. Uh, but looking uh-huh. at it without the context, that this marvelous sort of uh, the, these marvelous questions. Uh, well, exactly, because we do. I I get a lot of um, cheap laughs out of uh, citing examples from old course books, uh, and you know, challenging the audience to think of a, a context in which these sentences would be used. Go on, g- uh, give us a couple then. Oh, well, okay, if you insist. <laughs> <laughs> Is, this is a one from it. It actually, I mean, to be fair, it's, it was printed. I'm just looking at the date here, 1876. But it's a kind of juxtaposition of the sentences, which is so bizarre, including as well. So here's a sequence from a, an exercise, a translation exercise. Have we had the mattresses of the foreigners? We have not had them. Has the Englishman had my good work? He has had it. Has your aunt had my fine pencil? <laughs> she has had it. Has she had my gold... <laughs> candlestick and so <laughs> as it goes on and then there's a one a more recent one which i get a lot of laughs up from which is a bit more like what you're describing of ken's one of the but again difficult to think of a context this is my head my brain is in my head on this and <laughs> on this side of your head is an ear and on this side of your face is an eye. I mean, it's a bit like maybe a cubist like a painter describing... <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, the Picasso thing, yes. A toe of your right foot is on the seat. Your neck is bent. Now, I mean, I challenge you. I suppose a doctor. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I have to tell you this, but your, ex- your x-ray shows that your neck is bent. <laughs> I'm laughing, but I'm also thinking about how many times we really have done those kind... Not necessarily those sentences, but making students kind of point and go oh yes my head and, and i'm almost cringing exactly. well, I mean, <laughs> but i mean there was generations of language teachers and course books writers who took this for granted there was no question that this was kind of like inappropriate because after all you could argue that language classrooms have their own if you like register or discourse or genre or whatever so this is perfectly permittable because this is language on display not language for real use but yes. That's true, and and that's probably why every language in every language classroom probably has used at one point that like the pen is on the table because I, you know, I think you you know le stylo es sur la table or or whatever. I did it in Spanish. I remember when I was learning Spanish, and that that sounds like such a a boring, inauthentic sentence. But I suppose you know the teacher struggling for a sentence to illustrate a preposition and has a pen in his hand exactly. and is standing right in front of a student just slams it on the table and says on the pen is on the table <laughs> absolutely and there's nothing more pedagogically you know real than that even though it's not necessarily a sentence that but yeah no it's interesting and i uh, one of the uh, one of my favorite bits of uh, 
uh, in response to this or satires of this was James Joyce, who actually taught English for a number of years as a struggling writer. He taught for the Berlitz School in Trieste, yeah. uh, among others. And he wrote this kind of, he was so frustrated by this ridiculous language that he wrote a kind of a rant uh, to Berlitz himself saying, Berlitz, Berlitz, what, what have I done to deserve this from you? Senor Berlitz and Senor Joyce, fool and beggar, what is a pachyderm? See that man there with a trumpet for a nose and that sizable belly. There's a pachyderm, etc. And you wonder, in fact, you know, how whether this bizarre, almost surreal use of language that you get on these old course books might have, in fact, fed into his later writing like Finnegan's Way. <laughs> There's a thesis for you. Yeah. Well, that would be an interesting question. But coming to a larger issue, I mean, we're going to gonna have to be wrapping this up, unfortunately. I think we could go on for quite a long time on these sentences. But one of the larger questions I want to sort of wrap this more or less up with is is the sentence i mean we're looking you were citing examples from the 1800 late 1800s uh from up till now the modern um course books technology things like duolingo and everything the the sentence still seems to ho hold sway over grammar what what What's about that? Is it is it just it is the thing that makes the most sense? Or well, I think yeah. No, for a long time we've been trapped in if you, like what you might call the tyranny of the sentence. The idea that grammar or language even is 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 sort of its archetypal quintessential forms is well crafted sentences that begin with a capital letter and finish with a full stop because we know that in spoken exactly, language yeah. such a thing such things don't exist. Uh, and also, the sentences on their own seldom manage to capture enough meaning. I mean, it's very difficult, and I'm finding this at the moment. I'm looking for sentences which embody the use of the de uh, definite and indefinite article. But you've really got to go across sentences before you can see why a definite article has been chosen. Mm -hmm. So sentences on their own, I mean, they're kind of useful for teaching purposes. But if we think of them as the, as the kind of limits of grammar, then we're seriously... Um, it's a kind of tunnel vision view of language, I think. We do need to go, dare I say it, beyond the sentence. Uh, but we'll never quite escape sentences. And sentences, of course, are the basis of a lot of linguistic theories of language. Think of Chomsky's uh, transformational generative grammar. He was only interested in well-formed sentences, and it produced well-formed sentences which were completely meaningless. Another fam the most famous sentence in all linguistics is colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Uh, simply to make the point that gram grammat grammaticality, if you like, being well-formed, does not rely on meaning. It's all about getting the right words in the right order. But I think, you know, uh, other theories of language and more functional ones and more discourse-based theories, we've moved and should be moving away from this dependence on just individual sentences. Now it's time to welcome back our podcast game, Timeline. Welcome to Timeline, the TEFL commutes on the move game for teachers. Okay, in order to play Timeline, you need to draw yourself a mental timeline. We've all used timelines in the classroom. Get the pen, draw a line. Over here on the left is usually the past. Moving towards the right is the future. With somewhere with a little cross or an intersection for now in the middle. So draw yourself that mental timeline now. Great, so now you're ready to play. Timeline at the ready. We're about to give you a number of items which you have to place on the timeline in the correct order. The items will come to you in a random order and you have to order them from the one furthest in the past to the one closest to now. Once we go over the answers, everything you get into the correct order earns you one point. Get a full house of points and you can win today's prize which is feeling very smug for yourself. Okay, are you ready to play? Today's topic is grammarians. Ooh. During our conversations with Scott for this podcast, he mentions a number of grammarians. So that's our topic for today's timeline. We'll give you the name of the grammarian and you need to put them on the timeline in order of date of birth. Ah. During our conversation, Scott gave us the names of four people. So these are the people you need to put in the correct order. Number one, Henry Sweet. Number two, Norm Chomsky, followed by Maximilian Berlitz, and finally, Henry Widdison. So remember, you're putting them in order of date of, date of birth. So that's Chomsky, Widdison, Berlitz, and Sweet. 
thinking time. How did he do? Did he get them all? Let's find out. So, in the correct order, first up, you'll have born on the 15th of September, 1845, Henry Sweet. He'll be followed by Maximilian Berlitz, who was born in April, 1852. Next on the timeline, there'll be Noam Chomsky, who was born in 1928. And finally, the baby of the bunch is Henry Willison, born in 1935. So that's four marks if you've got them all in the correct order and no arguing with our sources which of course uh, tend to be Wikipedia. Join us again in a future podcast episode for another game of Timeline. So mm-hmm. thanks uh, to Scott for that. It's a lot of food for thought. I'm sure we'll, one of those podcasts will have to play a few times. Scott, before we go, where can people find you or find the find things that you mentioned in 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 this podcast? Is is there a place they can go? Uh, yeah, you can go to my website, um, scottthornbury.com, dot uh, com, uh, and I've got a couple of blogs which are at the moment. Uh, Slight so moribund while I uh, catch up with various other projects, but I mean, yeah, um, I've actually talked about sentences on my blog, an A to Z of ELT, S for sentence, I think, is one of the entries. Uh, so um, please visit. And you said there's a second edition of about language coming. When can and that, that is coming out uh, at the end of next year or the beginning of the following year. And, and the, you know, things take their time. And meanwhile, as I say, I'm having a lot of fun <laughs> trawling through the corpora <laughs> looking for interesting sentences. Right, think- so we'll, we'll put the links to those uh, websites on, on the TEFL commute one so people can find them if they want to go and uh, look stuff. The A to, the A to Z especially is a, is a useful resource to, to go to for all things teach teaching. And I'm very happy to hear that a new edition of About Language is coming out. This is a book that has accompanied many a Delta trainee <laughs> on their, on their journey towards better uh, understanding of grammar. So it's really good to hear that that's getting updated and look forward to, to seeing and getting a, our hands on a copy of that. Scott, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay. Uh, That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, enjoy the rest of your commute. As your commute is coming to an end, here's an activity you can take into class. Write the following sentence stems on the board. One of us can. Two of us can. Three of us can. None of us can. Elicit ways of completing the pattern from the students. Then divide them into groups of four and give them a time limit. They have to generate as many true sentences as they can about their group using these stems. Ask the groups to share some of the more interesting sentences they've created. This activity can be adapted to many structures. Instead of can, use has, have got, or is, are going to, or used to. We found this activity in Scott Thornbury's book, simply titled Grammar, published by Oxford University Press in 2005. You can read more about this and find links and ideas for this episode to use in class at our website www.tefelcommute.com. You've been listening to The Tefel Commute, an original podcast produced and presented by Lindsay Clanfield, Sean Wilden and James Taylor. Don't miss out on any episodes by subscribing to us on iTunes or YouTube and by visiting us at www.tefelcommute.com.